Welcome to the Alphagenics podcast, where every week we speak to amazing guests from the world of health, well-being, longevity, biohacking, and of course, men's health. So I'm delighted today to welcome Jay Campbell. Jay, welcome. Ross, what's up, my brother? I appreciate the opportunity, as always, when I get a chance to come on podcasts. Uh, I manifest that it is going to be a very resonant, energetic vibration, and that many, many people will benefit. So again, appreciate the opportunity, my bro. No worries at all. I mean, for I've read the TFT Bible, you know, back in 2020, I think. But for anyone who isn't familiar with your work, tell us a little bit about Jay Campbell. How did you get involved in this exciting space? Yeah, so I mean, it's a long story. So I'll give you the hundred thousand foot sum- summary. Um, you know, I've been on tes- therapeutic testosterone now for going on almost 23 years. Uh, when I was 29 years old, I was an ex college and professional basketball player. Got kicked in the testicles playing in a uh, you know men's uh, adult recreation league, and I took myself out of the game. And about seven to eight, nine weeks later, I don't remember, my body just collapsed. I mean, I was run down. Uh, my back, you know, just joint. Just I just was achy, breaky. I just had no energy. So at the time, I went to a, uh, you know, the job that I had, I was working in advertising in Los Angeles in Southern California, and I went to my PPO doctor. This is actually when there was health benefits in the United States. And he recommended me to an, um, an endocrinologist. And as I like to say, there's really no coincidence. There's only synchronicities. And, of course, he recommended me to um, an endocrinologist who was like one of the world's leading guys. And, it, again, this is all random at that time. Uh, by the name of Dr. Raymond Scruggs. And, you know, he took my labs or took my blood work and he saw that I had uh, the testosterone free and total levels of a geriatric, you know, and he's like, look, man, I can put you on therapeutic testosterone and have you ride his reign in, you know, seven, eight, 10 weeks, but make sure you go home and get approval from your, at the time I was uh, engaged. I wasn't married yet, but we were close. And so I did, you know, I went down, you know, went, went back home. Um, and I asked my wife at the time, who's not long gone, shout outs to her, Kelly, uh, and she's like, look, you're a smart guy, you know, let's see what happens. So went to his, uh, his clinic and he injected me with, uh, 75 or 60 milligrams. I don't remember of, uh, testosterone sipinate and, uh, then did it again, uh, four days later. And then after he did it twice with me, he sent them to me. I still remember they were like in plastic bags, you know, with the holographic seal and his script and said, Hey, you got to do this yourself. That's a whole nother story. Cause I remember the first time I had to inject myself, I literally sat there for like 90 minutes, dude. I couldn't, I mean, I was paralyzed with fear. And my, my, my fiance, again, her name's Kelly at the time. She walked up to me and she looked at me and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, up, 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 and she just took it out of her hand and just jammed it into my quad. And, put, put, and then I'm just like, Oh, it doesn't even hurt. Right. But, 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 you know, to, to, to make a very long story short, I, uh, exactly as he said, about six to eight weeks later, I found, I started feeling insane. And when I went back, meaning, well, not, not insane, like so many other people who don't know what they're doing on this, as you know, feel, uh, and he wanted to take me off. And I was like, no way. Are you kidding me? Like, there's no way I'm coming off this. This is the most unbelievable thing. So then from that moment on, I would say fast forward 10 years. And I just became this like incredibly, you know, astute student of, hormones and biohacking and how, how do I optimize myself from a physical and mental, you know, uh, level the spiritual came after, but, uh, you know, there wasn't, you know, this is back in 1999 through 2000 and say eight, and there was nothing, you know, there was Nelson Virgil's book, which was testosterone, a man's guide. There was Michael Mooney and testo- in his book, but these guys were like seeking out, uh, testosterone because they were dying from HIV, at least in their minds they were, cause that's what they were diagnosed. Oh, it, you know, AIDS or HIV is a death sentence. Um, so these guys were experimenting in that regard and th- and always, whenever I do an interview, I always shout out to Nelson because he helped me publish my book, but you know, fast forward 10 years, you know, the people that knew me in my insider circle, I was still kind of like a high ranking advertising executive, uh, in the digital automotive space, but people who knew me, they would see me and they, you know, were impressed by my physique and they would usually ask me like, how do you look the way you do? You know, and I'd be, I literally look him dead in the eye, Jay Campbell and say, I use therapeutic testosterone. And that would easily, you know, you would either get like, what the fuck you're on steroids, blah, 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 you know, go away. Or they would be like, wow, that's interesting. Tell me more. So eventually the tell me more crowd convinced me to write a book. And in 2014, before I published the book, the book was pretty much done. It was mostly a white paper, but I mean, you know, the outline was done and, what I was sending out to people was like 25 pages. And so I sent it out to Rick Collins, the famous 
you know, lawyer, attorney for sports performance and, you know, uh, steroid law and professional bodybuilding, who's now a very close personal friend. Uh, I sent it to Nelson and I sent it to a couple other people. Well, Rick responded right away and he was like, dude, this is amazing. I don't know who you are, but, you know, very truthfully, because I asked him, I was like, what's the risk of a non-licensed medical professional putting a book out there like this? And, and, you know, Rick being an attorney was like, well, there's always risk. It just takes one U.S. senator to get a bug up their ass about you and you're paying me $250,000, right? So it was like one of those things. So I was like, oh, you know, I'm pretty successful in the realm that I'm in. I'm backing off. Three months later, Nelson Virgil sent an email to me in the middle of the night. And he was like, I don't know who you are, but he's like, this is amazing. You have to publish this. And so he gave me a cell phone number. So then I texted him. I, I, you know, it, it was that moment in time. But uh, I remember I was riding in, in the car with my wife and uh, I got the email. I was, you know, on my cell phone and I was looking at it. And so he's, I said, what do you think I should do? Because we had shelved it. And she's like, text him. You know, she was like, do it. And so I texted him. And then after that, you know, he mentored me. And a year later, the book was published. And that was in 2015, which was the original book, the definitive, the TRT manual. Mm -hmm. um, and that was uh, in November of 2015. And then, you know, honestly, fast forward to today, I've written six other books since then. I've met all these amazing people. Uh, obviously, I'm considered, a, you know, a, one of the world's leading experts on hormone optimization and peptides. Uh, and, and, you know, I meet people like you. I, you know, I do podcasts. I do interviews. I lecture. Um, it's been a whirlwind, man. I mean, you know, when I was 42, I was just a, you know, a typical, like I say, ad executive wage slave. And now I'm like this online gypsy, you know, people ask me now, like, what do you do? I'm like, well, it's kind of hard to explain. I have all these different income streams that come in from all these different places. And my accountant hates me. I'm kind of an author, a podcaster, you know, it's weird. Like people ask you, like, what do you do? And it's like, I don't know. I don't know how to really describe what I do. Uh, it used to be simple. Oh, I'm an ad sales guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But, but now that's not the case. And, uh, you know, truthfully, like I said, it's a long winded story, um, to get to where we are now, but, um, it's been an amazing blessing being able to meet so many people and, you know, experiment and biohack. And, you know, my website now is getting 30,000 unique visitors a month. Right. So it's like, I have so many people that come in from so many different angles. I've had my podcast, since 2015, Ross, and it originally was the TOT Revolution podcast. Uh, but when I went to Peru in 2019, right before the scamdemic happened, I had really a, just kind of like a spiritual, you know, call, I mean, I wouldn't call it a revival, but just a, essentially an, a, an essential moment where I was like, you know what, I'm not TOT Revolution anymore. I'm going to be Jay Campbell and I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. And if people don't like it, they can fuck off. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and in truth, it actually was bigger because I realized that so many people, when they become health optimized, also start becoming more spiritually optimized. And so I attracted all these guys and women uh, who were into this space and were also becoming much more, uh, quote unquote, attuned to what I like to say, what is right, which is like creation. Yeah. Um, so it's been it's been amazing, bro. And like I have the most amazing life. My wife and I moved down here to Mexico in uh, November of last year. We ejected from the States and so now we're expats. You know, she, she we, we actually are both dual citizens now, so we can just, you know, kind of go wherever we want. And, uh, and, you know, I make my living now podcasting and being an affiliate marketer and selling products and, you know, all the stuff that guys like us do. You know what I mean? So it's amazing, man. I'm, I'm totally blessed. Um, lo love that. Um, I, I've got my, I'm in my three year temp temporary resident of Mexico. So That's I awesome. I can go for citizenship as well. Very um, cool. I have a guy if you need a guy, but I'm sure you have a guy too. So, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so, tell us a bit about peptides because in the UK, we're behind you. So, it's still illegal here. You can't be prescribed it there for research purposes. But, of course, a lot of the guys we work with are researching themselves. Yeah, of course. Um, so what's they, your they, they experiment on their laboratory animals? Yeah, yeah, of course they do. Yeah, bro, it's it's truly amazing. Um, and I'll actually take you a step for, further. So when you and I just connected, and again, I apologize for being late, and I appreciate you making time to do this. Um, I'm actually writing an article right now on bioregulators. Actually, my team, my con my content team, and I, and I was editing the article. And bioregulators are bigger than peptides. Now, that's not, you know, that's a that's a strong statement, but I, I, I'll stand behind it. Now, bioregulators have been in Russia and the Ukraine and Bulgaria and, let you know, just call it former Soviet Union uh, countries and republics, nations, whatever. And they've been using them for 40 years in scientific research. And 
dude, these things are so unreal. They're mostly oral capsules and they're tissue specific and they have no side effects. So they don't pass through the liver. They don't cause kidney issues or filtration, you know, renal fil filtration issues. And they literally go to work on at the exact site. And I'll give you an example that, you know, most people can relate and understand to. All of us as aging men have prostate hypertrophy, right? It's inevitable unless you have your prostate, you know, pulled out, which would be a terrible decision. I mean, they, they, there's still a lot of guys that get talked into doing this. It's the most, it's, it's literally an arcane medieval procedure. And if you have it done, it's 50, 50, that you will literally become sexually dysfunctional. And of course, allopathic medicine just never tells guys this. I mean, do you have any guys I've counseled for a lot of money who I've told, here's a guy, call this guy, sue the hospital, sue the doctor, because they weren't even told that there was a risk that they would become sexually dysfunctional. So if you don't have that done, you're going to have some form of prostate hypertrophy as you age. So imagine taking a peptide bioregulator for the prostate starting at the age of 40. That's a capsule that has no side effects that you take 10 days a month, every two months. And it literally works to reduce the size of your prostate as you age, ensuring that you don't have prostate hypertrophy, which as you know, for a man is horrible because it means we have to get up and piss twice at night when we're sleeping. So it disturbs our deep sleep and our polyphasic sleep. And then of course, also as we get older and older, the likelihood that we're going to have a form of what is you know known as PCA, which is prostatic cancer is over 80% if you reach the age of 80. And obviously guys like us are all going to reach that age because we live for it. So imagine how powerfully profound a peptide bioregulator is now for that. And then imagine that every single organ system in the body has specific bioregulators that you can use to optimize that organ as we age. So, and, 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 and dude, I can get deeper. You can... You could do, yes. Well, I mean, you could start taking them earlier, but you know, the recommendations that like Dr. Victor Cavinson, who's kind of the father of bioregulator research, uh, Phil Mikens, who I just did a podcast with, well, I did it with him two months ago, but it just ran on my channel on Monday. You know, these are two of the leading experts in the world about bioregulators. And that's where they kind of come in. Victor's in his nineties now. He barely doesn't really lecture anymore. Um, but Phil's the main voice now. Um, and they, they say around 40. Right. You, you absolutely could probably start doing it earlier, especially with the you know degradation and the environment now in all the major cities around the world. You know, we're all the endocrine systems and thyroid and our, and our pancreas. We're, we're just being assaulted right by all this shit. So you could probably look at some things. And then, of course, if you're treating your body like a dumpster fire, like if you were you know former alcoholic or smoker or whatever, you know, there's other things you can start to work on, too. I mean, today's article is about a blood flow bioregulator. For people that have poor blood flow, again, smokers, alcoholics. Um, so all of these things, bro, are like, you know, I call them quantum medicine because they're so far beyond, you know, what allopathic is, which is, you know, just band-aiding symptoms. But mm -hmm. the coolest part about them is you can actually combine them with peptides. So I just kind of took you on like a, you know, a runaround from the original question and I'll get back to peptides. But peptides and bioregulators definitely represent an entire new frontier in healing. I don't even call it medicine. Because medicine is going away. Medicine is Rockefeller-based, petroleum distillate medical products that are harmful to organ systems. They're obviously hor they're harmful because most of them do not uh, address, address the root cause of your illness. They, again, they are just Band-Aids um, to you know, alleviate symptoms, which, as you know, over time cause more symptoms. You know, yeah. it's a cottage Maybe industry. More medication, so. well, it's a cottage industry to be in your 60s. And to be taking medicines to literally cover the side effects of the other medicines. The average American right now who's 64 years old or, or older takes 20 pills a day. That's not supplements. That's, yeah. med that's meds. That's, this is how broken and bankrupt and completely dysfunctional the allopathic medical system is in the USA. I'm sure it's the same in, in Britain. I mean, you and I both know that socialized medicine is no better than private medicine. I mean, it's all a nightmare, right? So it's like all of this shit is going to collapse. And what will come in is peptides and bioregulators. But again, the individual, the people that watch our shows, you know, you have to become the proactive scientist of your own health. You have to understand this. But going back to your original question, peptides is like a real sketch space, right? Like I am a affiliate marketer for limitlesslifenootropics.com, which is now one of the top three biggest 
research chemical company, quote unquote, peptide vendors, suppliers in the world. Um, and the reason that I promote for them is because they're the only one on the planet that actually does COAs, which are certificates of authenticity for every single peptide that they give you. Okay. Wow. Independent lab analysis, both China and US made. And let me also explain this because people don't understand this. And again, you know, Chris, the owner of Limitless hates when I say this because he's like, don't, don't give them everything. But I'm Jay Campbell. I tell you the truth, right? There's no, there's it's pure transparency and authenticity. Every single drug in the world today, every single one of them comes from China. There are some raw materials that come out of India, but it's a very small percentage. When people say made in the USA or made in China, I want people to understand what this means because most people are being led by scam artists and internet hucksters. All raw materials come from China that are drugs, okay? A lot of them are shipped to the States, to the UK, to Australia, to wherever, and then they're made in warehouses and steri you know, sterility process controlled facilities, GMP facilities, that um, they, they can then you know, claim that they're made in the USA or made in the UK or made in Australia, you know, whatever. But dude, at the end of the day, it's the same raw material. It's the same constituent. And all that shit comes from China. Now, I know somebody's going to watch this podcast and say, Jay Campbell's full of shit. Don't listen to him. We make this in Niagara Falls and blah, 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 blah. But again, if you really break this down and you say, okay, you made it, but where did you get the raw materials to make it from? Yeah, when that that's from, what you're going to say. It comes from China. So you see in peptides right now, and again, this is why I love Chris, the owner of Limitless, is that he tells you China, U.S. He says sourced China, made in the U.S. Right. So it's like he's telling the truth, but still, because the USA is a corporation owned by the Vatican and the, uh, and the London's the financial center. Uh, the reality is, is they got to mark their up, bro. You got to, there's a lot of people with their hands in the till in the USA, right? So it's like anything that they say US made or US manufactured is always higher, more expensive. Because people ask me this all the time. They're like, bro, I appreciate you being honest, but like, what's the difference between lyophilized from China and lyophilized in the USA? And I literally look them right in the eye if I'm not talking to them. I, I mean, if I'm talking to them, most of the time I'm just responding. Um, I just say nothing. You know, if you, if you seriously are using both of these and you can tell me honestly that you notice better results with, you know, China versus USA or vice versa, you're full of shit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's like some, you know, and I, and I should step back. There's a lot of peptide vendors out there now. And I, and I need to tell you about this too, because this is new stuff, but there's a lot of peptide vendors out there that are definitely making bogus shit, right? They're brewing it up in their basement, their kitchens, wherever, They've got, you know, an ad team that puts them on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and they suck people, you know, they suck people in. But a lot of stuff has changed in the last two months. This is really insider intel. So it's, you know, great break story for you. But uh, basically a lot of the raw materials that, are, that have been coming out of China for most peptide vendors, again, research chemical companies, and, and this even affects compound pharmacies, uh, has been shut off. Okay. You now have, this has all been in the last two months. You now have to be purchasing at a supply, a quantity, a, a, you know, a bulk quantity that puts most of the little mini miniature peptide vendors out of business. In fact, within 90 days, bro, there's not going to be a lot of peptide vendors. Like you got to be able to spend 500,000 to a hundred to a million dollars to purchase in bulk. If you're going to get anything out of China anymore, because they basically have been shutting it down. Now, to, to extrapolate even further and move it into compound pharmacies, I'm sure you've heard this, the states are cracking down, okay? They are going after compounders who are, you know, selling, just call them adulterated versions of pharmaceutical retail products, right? Like, I'll give you an example, like the GLP-1 agonists, which are terzapatide and semaglutide. There's others, but those are the two that most people are familiar with, that most media uh, and by the way, those are amazing tools. We could talk about that if you want to go deeper in that. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet about them, but they're amazing tools. I've been using both of them for over a year with clients, myself, my wife. Amazing tools, but again, like everything, there's context, right? You have to understand how to use them. Um, they basically have just put out in the last two weeks cease and desist letters. And when I say they, I mean the FDA and Big Pharma and whoever other you know alphabet agency that's behind them. To all the compounders saying you can't put them out anymore unless you sell Manjaro, which is the retail version of terzapatide, or uh, you know what is a, a, a Zempic, which is the retail version of semaglutide. And if you don't, we're coming in and we're going to shut you down. 
Okay. So it's getting weird out there. And that's why I tell people like the goal, the cool thing is, is the research chemical companies are not under the supervision, at least not yet that the compound pharmacies are. And again, I get it right. Like the FDA wants to make sure that they make their money, their pound of flesh, and they want to make sure that people are purchasing the retail versions, which by the way, um, Ross are five to seven times more expensive. Right. So if you're a compounder out there right now and you're selling, you know, terzapatide in bulk to a, let's say, a hundred men's health hormone optimization clinics like yours, uh, and you're selling it, you know, a 20 milligram bo- bottle for 340 bucks or something like that, uh, they're going to say, nope, not anymore because a 10 milligram vial of, uh, you know, uh, what is it called? Um, I forget the, the, the name brand. Monjaro is 1250 bucks. So you can't do that anymore. And this is what's been happening for the last six to eight months. So, I mean, again, dude, in the, in this post scamdemic corporatized world, they're like, we're not going to have any more of this. So what's going to happen is, you know, and again, this is more of my opinion than anything that I really truly know. But I mean, I've talked to a lot of people very recently about this and how crazy it's getting is you're going to have a giant underground market through research chemical companies. But again, only players, only A players are going to be involved in this because the little guys are not going to be able to purchase at the, the level that they need to stay in business. It's, it's crazy how weird everything's getting. I think you also know, too, that on May 11th is, quote unquote, D-Day in the United States, where they're basically changing the laws for telemedicine. Yes. So all the telemedicine providers, in fact, I'm going to be in Miami next week, you know, meeting with a lot of doctors at AMMG. You know, coming up with alternative strategies. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, you know, so for your listening audience, what this means is, is like basically in the States and a lot of Canadians probably face this. And I'm sure there's tons of people actually in the UK who travel to the States for business that have doctors, you know, in the States that they get their telemedicine stuff from. So for people to understand this, the law and it's, by, it's changing by the day. And there's a lot, there's a huge lobby now attempting to get this thing forestalled. I don't see it. I, I don't think it's going to get fixed because ultimately they just want to cut back on the number of people that are, you know, doing telemedicine. Because again, they, the reason this all blew up Ross is, um, you know, obviously with COVID, they lessened a lot of the restrictions. So a lot of more mail order and, you know, non face to face appointments were going on, but since they removed the emergency mandate for COVID, they're basically saying now, Oh no, you can't do this. But for the, the audience, so they understand this. If you're in California, Texas, or Florida, and you have a doctor in one of those states, not in your home state, you now have to, again, according to the law, visit them in person once a month and to get a controlled three substance like testosterone, like thyroid, whatever it is they write, peptides, uh, growth hormone, you can only get one month supply. So for an example, like for somebody like me, my doctor's in Arizona, I'm technically in Mexico now, but I have a license, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a state resident of California and of course, Florida. Um, he is not allowed to send me 90 days supplies of meds anymore, which is what I've been getting for four years. Yeah. Now I'll extrapolate that from California to Florida, Florida to California, Texas to New York, New York to California, where, you know, again, most of the successful type of people who are using uh, hormonal optimization get. And it's a, it's a, it's a catastrophe because these people are not going to be flying once a month to sit down and meet with their doctor when they were doing it by zoom or FaceTime or whatever stream yard. I mean, it's insane. So, I mean, dude, like the big clinics are fucked because the big clinics have literally 10,000 plus patients, men and women like this. And, and again, the majority of them are not in their state. They're not local. So what does that mean? And then the other thing is, and I'm sure you've seen this, and I don't know if you guys are affected in the UK like we are in the States, bro, they're already out of medications in the States right now of the top selling stuff. It's almost like they built this in, especially with like terzapatide and semaglutide. I mean, there's like, no, there's nothing, there's not even product. Yeah. So it's going to get really weird really soon. And, you know, when people message me, I tell them like, hey, man, I don't have an answer right now, but just, you know, be, be nimble and be ready to pivot. You may have to get a local do- doctor. Now, again, there's smart people out there. Rick Collins is one of them. And he's saying, oh, it's not as bad as, you know, we think it's going to be. It's probably somewhere in between. And, you know, it may just be that you have to get a surrogate doctor. And then that surrogate doctor in your local town will then interface with your telemedicine doctor. But when I talk to really smart doctors and clinics, who are big time telemedicine players, they say that's not going to, that's not going to fly 
for very specific reasons. I'm not going to get into that here. You know, it's getting into the weeds, but the whole global hormonal optimization space is about to change, bro. It and really not, is. And not for the better. A hundred percent not for the better, but it's like, see, this is what I always say. I'm obviously a glass half full guy. Um, we will improvise. We will adapt. We will pivot. Whatever is necessary is necessary. Bro, we may have a gigantic underground economy. I, yeah. I mean, it literally may become just like crypto is. I mean, people, this is what's so crazy is, right? Like still, when you see these statistics, it's mind blowing. 90% of the planet still does not own crypto. 90%. It's like if you don't own crypto at this point, just as a hedge to fiat collapsing, then you know what, man? I got no, I got no, you know, you're, you're, you're who you are, fear yeah. or not. You know, I mean, it's pretty simple. And I, and look, I was a holdout. I didn't do crypto until 2019. You know, I missed the run. I had a lot of people come to me and be like, hey, man, I just put $5,000 in Bitcoin. I mean, dude, if you had to put $5,000 in Bitcoin in 2012, do you know what it's worth right now? I mean, I don't have to say it, it's worth a lot. Yeah. Exactly. Hundreds of millions. Exactly. I mean, that's not, that's not, an that's, that's literally not an exaggeration. I literally was in a men's group in 2012 and they had these three guys that came in and they were like, look, everyone in this room right here is capable of putting $5,000 into what we want to tell you to do. And th those guys, by the way, like twice a year for everybody that was at that conference, it was in West LA at metal. They sent an email <laughs> Twice a year to all those emails saying, hey, by the way, this is what you're worth if you <laughs> if you want to put that. And dude, I'm telling you, like in 2017, I remember looking at that and I was literally like, I mean, I was like, you know, off balance and vertigo for like two minutes or whatever. But whatever, you know, we all have those Willy Wonka moments in our life and some of us take them and some of us don't. But you'll get another one, you know, just be be, be courageous and take a risk. You know, don't be that yeah. risk averse where you can't do it. But like now... This is what I tell people, especially in my private groups. I'm like, you have to have crypto now because if it all goes to shit, how are you going to buy your products? How are you going to buy your meds? How are you going to get your testosterone, your peptides, your growth hormone, your metformin, your, you know, your thyroid? I mean, because if it goes to underground, bro, you're not going to be buying it with fiat. Yeah. Or your CBDC. That's not going to work. Exactly. So it's like, it's very simple. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a glass half full guy. I'm not going to jump into the paranoia that so many people have right now. And I say, you know what? Some form, as always, economies of scale develop, and there will be some form, an option for guys like us, women like us, to continue on the same path that we're on. But you, you're just going to have to be ready to adapt. It's that yeah. simple. It has to happen because, you know, with longevity medicine and hormone optimization is really only just getting started. Totally. We're learning so much about it. Totally. So, it can't disappear. It's going to continue just in one form or another. I agree. And, and, and you're right. And, and none of us even know really how that will, you know, um, evolve and what it'll look like. And bro, it may change this year. You just said it, the CBDC. Like, I mean, I got like my, all my conspiracy analyst guys that are like in the high levels of the military, you know, spec operator guys, they're all telling me it's going to happen this year. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, they're, you know, a couple of them. I have a call with one of them later today after my, my um, webinar. Um, is like, you're in the best place you can be, bro. Like Mexico, the entire economy is dependent on paper currency. They're not fucking moving anybody into the CBDC. They wouldn't even, the whole place would shut down. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it's, it's interesting, but man, living in the States, bro, not a good place to be. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to happen there sooner rather later. That's for sure. For sure. Um, let what about is another another thing that I know that you talk about uh, metformin? Is it good? Is it not? And because I've heard arguments both ways, and does it reduce testosterone? So does it fight against your your testosterone optimization? So it's a great question. Um, so here's the thing about metformin, man. Like I've been using metformin for what? So so since I started therapeutic testosterone one year later, I started using metformin. My wife has been using metformin now. Uh, we're in our 11th and a half, almost going into our 12th year together. I got her on immediately. You know, we both have had our biological age test done. We're both in our 20s and our biological age. We've done glycan age. We've done uh, true diagnostic. I mean, I believe, and, I, and it's really, I hate saying believe because that's a weak word. I know 
that metformin has lowered my biological age value. And it's also lowered my, my wife's biological age value. Uh, metformin is without question, it's really not a drug. It's mostly a plant, right? But again, uh, uh, Big Pharma patented it when they could back in the 40s. It's the most studied medication on the planet, okay? And remember, it's normally prescribed and given to people who are flaming dumpster fires of human beings called type 2 diabetics, right? To become a type 2 diabetic, you literally do not exercise. You do not train with weights. You eat like shit. You drink like too much alcohol. You eat, again, way too much sugar. And eventually your um, chemo receptors in your pancreas just give out. You know, I always tell people your chemo receptors are literally like a swinging screened in door to the, the main door. And you only have as many swings in your life as your insulin sensitivity allows. And so if you treat your body like a dumpster fire, eventually it just gives out and it just is, the hinge is broken and it just goes back and forth, back and forth. Then every time you eat any carbs, your insulin just crash, you know, sh spikes up and you crash through serotonin and you become fat and inflamed. And again, dude, I mean, you know, people don't realize this, but a type two diabetic is a miserable death. I mean, usually these people literally have their legs amputated, their feet, their toes, their arms, you know, they get gout. I mean, it's just horrific, right? So even those people using metformin, there's more than a thousand scientific published peer reviewed studies that show they live longer using metformin than non diabetic people not using metformin, right? So again, you're taking like the most diseased co -patient or co uh, comorbid patient population group versus non, and they live longer because metformin. Now, when you extrapolate that to healthy people, there's no drug more strong, stronger than extending life than metformin. Now to your question, does it lower testosterone? Because it's a very powerful mTOR regulating drug, it can, but here's the thing. Any lowering of testosterone with metformin is transient and uh, rate limited. So what I mean by that is, is it's not going to lower your testosterone very much. And if it does, it won't go very far. Now, again, I am not a guy out there telling people to use metformin and not also be hormonally optimized, right? So ultimately, if you're hormonally optimized, it's not even a remote concern. Now, there are really smart people out there that, you know, I've talked to about this and, you know, not really debated, but we've had, you know, an open conversation. And one of them is a really smart guy by the name of Stan Efforting, you know, the rhino, you know, he's a pretty big name in the bodybuilding community and stuff. And he's, uh, him and I have lectured, at, you know, various um, symposiums. And I got him to change his stance on it, you know, after I showed him the research. And by the way, you know, for anybody who wants to uh, read it, and again, I know most people can't even fucking read today. They watch podcasts. They have sound bites, you know, TikTok, six second clips. But um, I wrote an article that's 10,000 words. It's published at Harvard, uh, you know, the, the EDU, um, and of course, the Global uh, Educational Database. I forget what it's called now. That proves, you know, everything scientifically about metformin. It also gets rid of all the nonsense. You know, the biggest nonsense about metformin that you've heard, which is complete and fucking total nonsense, is that it causes mitochondrial disruption or dysregulation, which is completely, utterly retarded. In fact, I actually met the woman who published this research. Her name is Dr. Uh, something Mars, uh, Chandler Mars. Super nice lady. We met actually at A4M back in 2017. Um, or it was 2018. I don't remember any, you know, everything pre scandemic now, you just, it just clouds your memory. You don't even know the times, but, um, we met at, 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 for coffee, you know, and I had my chai tea latte and she had her coffee and I, you know, I, I went in not to challenge her, but it was more about like, look, here's your research that you're publishing. Did you know that the women, cause it was all women in this research that she used that, you know, and then Dave Asprey took out there, Peter Atia took it out there, all these different people influencers and, and medical professionals took this uh, data and extrapolated it. But I'm like, look, here's the information. You literally published this. And then all these people ran with this. These were obese, diabetic women taking 50 to 60 times the recommended dosage of metformin. And yeah, they had mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, please tell me how this extrapolates to healthy aging male and female population groups who take a thousand milligrams or less a day of metformin. You know, I mean, it could be 1600 to two if you're a man. 
And she looked at the research and she literally said to me, she said, hmm, that's interesting. And I said, interesting? You should probably do an article and recant. And she's like, ah, that's not going to happen. But she's like, I'm really grateful that you pointed this out to me. Wow. And now we're friends. And, and now we're friends, right? Like we talk, you know, I, she'll email me every now and then. She'll ask me, well, what do you think about this? So, I mean, again, man, like the truth about things is when people look at published research, you have to take it with a grain of salt because as my mentor once told me, we're all biochemically unique and individual. And what one person gets from a study is not going to extrapolate to the next person. And, 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 and by that nature, not one single study that's ever been done, Ross, can be replicated. So it doesn't matter whether they're in healthy population groups or, or sick. And again, most research, as you know, in the medical space is done in sick people yeah. uh, or rats. Yeah. <laughs> Rats are sick people. So, I mean, like, it doesn't really matter. There's so many people out there that have been brainwashed, especially younger people today about trust the science, trust the science, but fuck the science. The science is not relevant to the individual at the end of the day. The end user ultimately determines how he or she is going to respond. So it's like I always say, like, most people who get bad results from metformin have an inflamed microbiome. They've been destroying their body. And in the first seven to 10 days, the number one thing that's happening with metformin is it's upregulating acromantia, you know, which is a very powerful, you know, um, you know, in, in, uh, gut or intestinal fauna. It's a, it, it's a microbe. So it's cleansing your microbiome. So by day 10, you've killed all the nasty shit and pathogens and virulent agents that's growing in your stomach. So you're not going to have that feeling anymore. But I mean, I, you know, I probably have gotten a thousand messages in my life from people that said, bro, I had to kill metformin at day five. And I'm like, why'd you kill it? Because man, I thought I was going to die. And I'm like, bro, you are getting, you were being cleansed. You were being cured by metformin. It was killing all the shit that's in your gut from your horrible diet. And again, most people that, you know, complain have horrible diets. And so it's like, I always say like, you know, metformin is never going to outperform a terrible diet and lifestyle. So you got to change your diet when you start using metformin. You got to live insulin controlled. But I'm telling you, for people who live insulin controlled, who are hormonally optimized, there's nothing more profound. Um, again, it increases acromantia. It's anti-cancerous. It literally kills a through apoptosis, tumors. Um, it cleanses the brain. It cleanses the vascular pathways. The biggest thing is that for people that have autoimmune dysregulation or even disease, it crushes systemic inflammation. So it's like you take 500 milligrams a day as a, as, you know, cause a lot of women have autoimmune, right? And then they go and they get their diagnosis from their specialist and the specialist gives them 30 different wines. Ah, oh, you have Crohn's and lupus and Epstein Barr and all these other things. And so they take it home and then they start thinking about it spiritually of like, oh, I have all these diagnoses. And I'm like, no, you don't. You just have systemic inflammation. Plus you fucking worry about everything all the time because you listen to your doctors tell you that you're diseased and that you have all these diagnoses, right? So it's like, if you take metformin, and you cleanse your diet and you do all the things that you and I know you're supposed to do, it massively gets rid of inflammation. And then all of a sudden, once you don't have inflammation, you don't all of a sudden have all these diseases anymore because you don't have, I mean, bro, all disease is just inflammation. Yeah. Low, do, lo, low levels of inflammation from the higher the, 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 diets and most, the higher the inflammation over time, the more potent the disease ideology that you have, right? Like even cancer. Right. Like, like internal cancers are always from worry, uh, anxiety, emotionally based eating, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, and again, that comes from those things. So again, over time, the inflammation leads to the cellular degradation and then cellular degradation becomes some form of disease, but it really is simple. Get rid of inflammation, mm. stay lean. And the likelihood that you live longer and stronger is about as high as you can get it. I mean, you know, people ask me like, you know, because I don't, I don't, I don't like to just talk about drugs, right? Like I can talk about drugs so I'm blue in the face, but at the end of the day, like what's the number one thing that you can do if you're watching the show today to make sure you live longest and strongest, be lean, stay under 15% body fat as a man. And as a woman stay under between 15 and 20, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and, and if you want to take it a step further, stay around 10 to 12 as a man. If you stay 10 to 12% body fat as a man, you're going to live 80 years for sure. Unless you get hit by a bus, right? Which you can't really control. Yeah. But if you, if you lower your body fat to a level where you do not have that much systemic inflammation, you're going to live longer. It's impossible not to. Yeah. You're just healthier, better in every single way. 
Bro, do you knew that 90, you know, this is for your patient population. 90% of men who report, and we can go into this in this rabbit hole if you want, high estrogen symptoms, which by the way, don't exist. It's a myth, are fat. And when I say fat, they have too much belly fat mm -hmm. because most of these dudes are injecting test into the belly fat, right? They're doing subcutaneous injections and the, the body, because it's got fat right there, sees the testosterone as an exogen exogenous irritant. And so that irritant is causing a cytokine release. That cytokine release is causing the side effects that your doctors and, and most of these doctors measure as high estrogen. It's not. It's inflammation and it's um, insulin um, resistance. It's those two things that cause puffy nipples, you know, water retention, mood imbalances. They're always diagnosed as high estrogen. We never, I know I just shifted on you. I level shifted on you. But we never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, ever control for estrogen because estrogen is what gives us protection. Yeah. Estrogen gives protection to the brain. It gives protection to the bones. It gives protection to the vascular networks. It gives protection to the lymph. I mean, I mean, when you start killing and suppressing and crushing estrogen through AIs and God knows what else, even CIRMs. CIRMs are horrible. CIRMs have no place in therapeutic testosterone. I have gyno right here, right now. I'm getting it surgically removed when I get back from the medical conference on May 4th. I already had gyno in this nipple and it had it surgically removed in 2016. Uh, at that time, we didn't even know that gyno was genetic. We found out that gyno was genetic in 2018 from Dr. Anthony J. Shout out to him. Good friend of mine. Um, when he started coding for the gene, mm -hmm. right? So most people don't know that gyno is genetic. And so the bodybuilding bro world thinks that you can take, you know, raloxifene or Novadex or, you know, all these other suicidal AIs, you know, God knows, letrozole, all this shit. To, to suppress the symptom, the presentation of gyno, which is again, swollen gland tissue in the breast. And they think it works because it reduces the size. It goes away, but it's like, no dude, it's going to come back until you have that actual tissue excised. It will always be there and it will, it will present whether you're on testosterone or steroids or whatever at some other point in your life. And that's why a lot of guys, and by the way, just so you know, it's 60 Somewhere between 60 and 64% of men have the gene. They code for the gyno gene. I, I know the name of the gene, but it doesn't matter. And so you're going to have gyno at some point in your life. So this is more than one out of two, right? Yeah. And it could come in puberty. It could come at 60. It could come literally when you're 25 years old and you know, you, you're in great shape. And all of a sudden you just get a gyno lump. But most guys think that they can solve for it by using AIs and CIRMs. And you can't. Now, there is a difference, and this is where people will, you know, come after me. Some guys get, again, the, the flaring, the sensitivity, because their body is shutting down its natural production to use the exogenous form. That is transient. That will go away. A lot of guys will feel sensitive nipples or, or itchy nipples or whatever when that's happened and freak out and run to their doctor and say, I need an AI. Yeah. Or a CIRM. And a lot of times the doctors just write the scripts anyway because they don't understand. But you will know if you have gyno, meaning the gene, because when you have an actual presentation of a lump that's swollen and, and sore, you hug your daughter, you hug your, your wife, you hug your dog, whatever, and it's like, ah, fuck. That's feel it. the gene. And that has to be cut out. There is no solution for that. I'm telling you, dude, I... I probably get a thousand messages a month from guys on Instagram and TikTok, you know, saying, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I mean, they're so brainwashed. They're so utterly clueless, not because of fault of their own, just because of the bullshit information out there, bro. Mm -hmm. Some of the best doctors in the world still do not understand this. I mean, yeah. I get the names it's of guys. It's insane how they suppress estrogen into the single digits. And again, you know, to put this out there so that people understand this, you know, and, and, you know, to my doctor friends, I get it. You know, they're, they're going to say, but you know, Jay, it's not your medical license. It's on the line. And, you know, we, we, the, the, the state medical licensing boards are looking at the ranges and the standard mean deviations. And if we see, we show a patient with an estrogen too high, that's our ass. Right. And I get it. But at the end of the day, it's about the patient's health, not about your practice and whether or not you get audited. 
And that's the problem with, with this, bro, is like you really have to understand, meaning your doctors and you as an owner, you really have to understand like what is the importance here? Is it, is it the patient's health? You know what I'm saying? Which obviously you're safeguarded through your Hipp Hippocratic oath to guard and, and preserve, or is it that your company doesn't get audited by people, right? And, and, and it's an in-between world because a lot of these guys, you know, think that the lab ranges are the lab ranges and we got to keep people within the lab ranges or you're out of, you know, you're in trouble. And, and dude, I'm telling you, I've seen this so many times, like just the other day, people were like, I got an 80 sensitive estradiol. I got to push it down. No, motherfucker. Actually, that means that you are healthier than somebody who has a 40 estradiol because you have the most protection to all of those systems that I already mentioned. I know guys that have 180 sensitive estradiols and no symptoms and side effects because they are one of the lucky few that has massive protection to the brain, to the heart, to the bone mineral density, to the lymph, to the skin, to all the places that, you know, require high levels of estrogen to confer protection. But dude, I'm telling you, it's understood by less than 10% of people out there. It's mind blowing how many doctors, again, I will say name brand, famous hormone optimization doctors are crushing their patient's estrogen. It's nuts. And, and, and look, these are women's cancer drugs. They're not made for male anatomy and biology. They're yeah made for women who have stage three and four cancers, you know, metastatic tumors. They're not made for guys who are on 150 milligrams a week of testosterone, you know, to take a, a microdose. I mean, it's nuts, dude. I mean, and then, and then of course, you know, you have the guys that will be like, but bro, if I don't take a microdose, I get water retention and my dick won't get hard. I mean, all of that stuff is psychogenic. They've all created this reality in their mind because they're thinking about it. If I don't take my AI, it's not going to work. And so then they think about it, think about it, think about it, think about it. And that's what they create. Yeah. You just yeah. have to let go, dude. You just, you don't need an AI ever, ever. Now, Ben Pakulski, who's a very good friend of mine, you know, when I did a podcast with him three years ago, which is probably one of the most recognized and watched podcasts in the history of the world on therapeutic testosterone, you know, he made a very good point. And he said, and this is not applied to most people, but he goes, he can see why this extrapolates, especially into the bro world. He's like, bro, AI's killed me. He's like, when I took an AI, my brain was swelling. Because again, that's what it's doing. It's cr crushing your brain pathways. Your synaptic path is under stress. And he was like, but here's for me, when I was in my last week for a show, the only way, and he's right about this, by the way, the only way that I could get water, and again, this is a world-class top five bodybuilder, right? But the only way that I could actually get separation in my hamstrings on stage was to use one milligram of Arimidex a day for those last three or four days. And he's like, and it worked. And, I, and, I, and I'm like, you know what, bro? I totally get that. But again, he's sacrificing his brain health to finish in the top five on a bodybuilding show. So, I mean, it's like, no, if you're not a professional bodybuilder, you know, doing that for money and means and all this stuff and only doing it for short term. And you're doing that all the time because, bro, do you know how many guys in the bodybuilding world will say to me, and again, I've counseled so many of these guys, they'll be like, bro, I'm on three grams a week of blank. You know, and I, gotta, I know this is not therapeutic testosterone, but it's important for people to understand this. Uh, if I don't take the AI, I can't breathe. I have so much water retention, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, you're killing yourself, period, by taking that much gear. Yeah, but I can't compete and be a pro and be the size and the weight. I'm like, okay, well, it's one or the other. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, so it's like, but I mean, you know, guys will say that. They'll they'll be like, the AI works because it suppresses my water retention. It gets rid of the water. And it's like, okay, yes, that may be true, but you're missing the bigger picture. It's fucking up your health. You're shortening your lifespan. Like it's literally that simple. And I'll just move on from this and tell you it's the same thing to do with DHT inhibitors. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got four articles on my, way, on my website. DHT inhibitors are cell toxins. They literally are fucking up telomerase. They're shortening your telomeres. You without question, you know, I have all these guys that attack me. You're full of shit. I've been on DHT inhibitors, finasteride, dutasteride, whatever. You know, I forget the other one. 
for 30 years and my, it's keep it's kept my hair and i have no side effects and i'm like go get your biological age test done yeah. because you ain't gonna live that much longer i mean i mean again for guys that have been on them for 30 years taking high dosages and and that's the problem with these things bro is there's literally a group of men who have no side effects as you know 40 percent of men who take a dht inhibitor have sexual dysfunction in two weeks yeah. And PFS, post finized fastenoid syndrome. I just did a, uh, a TikTok and an Instagram about this. I mean, I in my life, and I'm 52, I've lost two friends who killed themselves who had PFS. They literally killed themselves, right? So this is a serious thing. It's obviously near and dear to my heart. But most people are not informed about this. The doctors don't tell them about PFS. The doctors don't tell them about the risk that they take to having this horrific thing happen to them by using uh, DHT inhibitors. They don't tell them that. They just, you know, for the hair, bro. You know, it also causes, again, uh, fertility issues. You know, I, I had a guy reach out to me like two months ago. I, I don't remember his name. He was in Germany. Pretty pretty big influencer. And he was like, hey, man, look, I want to give you this situation. Tell me what it is. I'm like, it's the fucking DHT inhibitor, bro. You've been on yeah. a DHT inhibitor for nine years because he was telling me he couldn't get his wife pregnant. You know, and I'm like, it's the DHT inhibitor. And he was like, wow. And then he went and got a, like a sperm process and stuff test and he got all that stuff and he had, zero, he had nothing, nothing. And he was always using HCG and he was always using clomiphene. And when he was on his test, he wasn't even abusing drugs. He was just, you know, therapeutic. Yeah. And he went and he looked at everything and he had nothing. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you're taking five milligrams a day of fucking finasteride or whatever it was. I don't know what the dosage was, but I mean, that's what it does. Yeah. So people have to understand this. AIs are bad. DHT inhibitors are bad. I'm not saying that DHT inhibitors may not keep your hair there because they probably can, but they're so bad for you health-wise, systemically, that they're not worth it. That's why, like, you know, going back to peptides, there are now peptides that are angiogenic, GHKCU, TB500, BPC, that we can use in the scalp along with, obviously, lifestyle, you know, low inflammation life that will regrow your hair. Combined with red hair, I mean, red light, combined with derma rolling, com combined with microneedling, combined with, uh, you know, what do you call it? Um, there's now the other thing, um, the red light, blue light combination, not blue light, but, you know, the, the specific type of light that, you know, electro uh, increases electromagne electromagnetic encephalication in the scalp. So there's a lot of ways to regrow your hair now that don't require crushing if, uh, DHT. But again, dude, DHT and, and uh, uh, estradiol, Two systems given to us by God, you know, creation force, whatever your, whatever your spiritual beliefs are. If you block them, shit's not going to go wrong, go good long-term, you know, yeah, yeah. suppress estrogen, cause health problems, suppress DHT or block DHT, cause health problems. That's the other thing is people don't realize DHT is five times more anabolic than testosterone. Right. So blocking that, like, of course, you're not going to have the energy that you have that testosterone normally gives you. You're not going to have the dopamine signaling. And you're definitely not going to have the anabolic cascade. Dude, again, so many guys will say, I don't get the results on testosterone. And I'm, you know, and you got to drill through, drill through, because they don't just volunteer. And I'm like, okay, you know, I mean, I've given up on some guys. And then they tell me that they've been on uh, finasteride for seven years. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, you didn't tell me that in the very beginning. Of course, you're not getting results from testosterone because you're blocking it. Yeah. But they're horrible, dude. So, I mean, like, you know, I hope I didn't just kill, you know, parts of your practice because, I mean, I know a lot of guys prescribe it. You know, do test ride topically is great. It works. Yeah, I know some guys have great results with that. But, yeah, we are your cellular <laughs> health, man. <laughs> It, it keeps hair on your head, but it shortens your lifespan. That's the thing, man. Is like, what is your game? Is your game to just have hair on your head? Is your game to live long and strong? That's what you have to make a decision on. You know, yeah. if, if you don't have genetic predisposition to hair loss, I guarantee you, you can use peptides in your scalp and minimize, if not stop shedding. I have genetic al alopecia uh, androgenic. This is my new, not mine, but my business partner's newest hair product. And I mean, dude, look how thick my hair is. And I should mm -hmm. be bald. People look at me and they're like, yeah, transplant. You're a fucking liar. No, I haven't. My hair is receded. My hair used to be right here, right? But I still have hair on my hair. And this is just from using a peptide. It's, it's literally that simple. 
and anyone can do it, even with androgenic alopecia. But again, you got to play the game right. You got to live a low inflammation lifestyle. You can't drink alcohol. I mean, you can have a glass of wine every now and then, but you can't be pounding, you know, brewskis and drinking vodkas. But again, it's all relative, man. People have to live, like I say, insulin controlled and inflammation suppressed or inflammation free. Yeah, that's a big thing, I think, to take away from today, isn't it? It's like it's the lifestyle peptides metformin testosterone they're a mate you know they can be transformative but they're not magic no you can't be doing all of that and then live in a poor life it's all exactly bro and, and that's the thing is right now peptides is blowing up you know my book my peptides book got published in february literally february 1st and it's still number one on amazon for like three different categories, top five for like 10 categories. It's blowing up in the UK, blowing up in Australia, blowing up in Canada. It's even blowing up in Japan um, because they translate it automatically now, I think on KDP. But, um, you know, just to, to, for people who watch this, because they're going to say to you, I can't believe you had Jay Campbell on and you didn't tell us his favorite peptides, right? So realistically, like right now, I love the GLP-1 agonists, but again, let's con context, right? You cannot be, because again, a lot of people are fat, bro. We know this, right? And they want to lose weight and that's cool. And these things work better than anything else, but you got to do it right. And, you know, all these people out there are screaming how they cause muscle loss. And you and I both know they don't cause fucking muscle loss. If you're a great big fat person and your doctor prescribes you a GLP-1 agonist like terzapatide or semaglutide and you stop eating and you lose weight, but you don't eat enough protein and you don't train with weights and you don't do cardio, then yes. You're going to fuck up your metabolism. You're going to smash your thyroid. And as soon as you come off, rebound weight gain. Okay? Mm -hmm. And yes, you will lose muscle. But again, this is simple. You take terzapatide. You eat one gram of protein per pound of lean mass, not per pound of body weight. This is very important, right? You're a 400-pound obese person. You can't be eating 400 grams of fucking protein a day. You're going to convert that to sugar. So what is your muscle? How much is that as muscle? I mean, if you're a 400 pound obese person, you're probably 35 to 40% body fat. So what is your muscle weight? Well, you probably got about 200 to 220 grams of protein for muscle. And then you cut your carbohydrates or, your, or you restrict your calories from there. Very simple. Lift, do cardio, take this. If you want to use like a peptide that, you know, is going to help with GH, tessamorelin, ipamorelin, CJC1295. Okay, those are the three. There's nothing else to fuck with. Don't use any of the GRP2s or 6s because they increase prolactin. They increase cortisol. They fuck up your sleep. They increase appetite. You don't want any of that, especially if you're trying to lose body fat. Tesofensine is probably my favorite peptide right now. Now, it's not a peptide. It's technically a small molecule, small molecule but it's an oral capsule. Uh, you take it in the morning. 250 milligrams seems to be the best dosage for most people because 500 some people feel it's too strong. Now, even, even at 500 or 250, people feel amazing on this. And that's because it increases brain-derived neurotropic factor. You take it the first day, um, and within an hour, Ross, you literally feel amazing. You're like, wow, I'm in flow state. Like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to create. I'm ready to write. I'm ready to record, talk, speak, present, whatever. And for some, un, I mean, I shouldn't say unknown, but I mean, because they understand the mechanism of action, it, it continues to keep, keep going. It, it, uh, you don't have receptor attenuation over time, so it doesn't lessen. And there's no addictive qualities. I mean, I've been using this now for, I started taking it in December of 2021. I've been off of it four months, or I went off of it four months after being on it for eight, and I restarted again. My wife and I restarted again in January, and it's amazing, bro. I mean, it's just an amazing, amazing medication. Uh, another thing about it, which is in time, usually like four months, um, the science shows it's a metabolic uncoupler. So it also, you also get body fat loss from it. So major focus, major dopamine signaling. Um, and then over time fat loss, but I mean, again, it's, it's, it, it's a, it's a great product because if you're in a, uh, a restrictive caloric restrictive diet, you know, somebody who's taking towards appetite too, it, it dulls your appetite. And, and it's very mild in dulling your appetite, but you have to think about it from a standpoint of like, you want to be motivated when you're not eating. So you're doing other things and not thinking mm -hmm. about food. So another great peptide. So, I mean, you know, between that, there's appetite for appetite suppression, the yeah. tesofensine for brain stimulation and also uh, metabolic uncoupling. And then if you want to enhance some, you know, burnt fat burning for GH uh, induction, 
you would have IPA, TASA, or CJC. And again, I think most people understand this by now. Whenever you inject a peptide, it has to be inje- injected on an empty stomach. It has to be. You don't have to be like 12 hours plus fasted, but you got to have at least 90 minutes to two hours without food so you can cross the blood-brain barrier effectively. And that's why you know we recommend most of the GH-inducing peptides to be injected first thing in the morning or right before you go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, Jay, I know you've got to jump off onto another podcast, but uh, I've absolutely loved today. It's been fantastic. How do people contact you? Where do, where do they where do they send you messages, Instagram or, or what? Yeah, so for sure. So I actually have a site. It's jcampbell.com forward slash free books. And when you go there, you can download the TOT Bible PDF. You can download the first two chapters for the new peptide book. Uh, there's also a book about how to raise your consciousness and then my uh, landmark first fat loss book on fasting, which is the metabolic blowtorch diet. That also PDF is free. And then from there they can figure out, but I'm pretty much on social media. I'm Jay Campbell, three, 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 Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Absolutely. Fantastic. Jay, it's been a real pleasure. Have Thank a you, Ross. I appreciate it, man. We'll talk. We'll talk soon. I got to bounce. Have a great one. Take care. Bye-bye.